I'll briefly summarize uh, the first frame that we have. We have the prologue, isn't it? We have a playwright who is all by himself in an empty temple. There's no deity there, there's no image. That in itself is symbolic, right? Uh, there is no superior spiritual power somehow directing this whole schemata in some ways. That it could be one way to look at that absence of the deity, right? So we have a playwright who is apparently cursed and he has to spend the night awake so that he can um, be alive for the rest of his uh, life, right? And he witnesses some flames which talk amongst themselves and the content of that talk is, um, can be loosely framed as gossip, right? Uh, gossip associated with the feminine domain, right? Uh, and predominantly linked to sexual affairs, predominantly. And we have a new entrant called a story, a female identity called story, who sets up a narrative in which we meet with Rani and Apana and Naga. So you can see how we have a set of interlinked stories one story being kind of linked to another and that is being linked to another and so on and so forth, right? Now, we kind of talked about the significance of an old lady not telling tales, which is why she's being punished by the presence of a young uh, woman in her husband's bedroom. And we talked about the importance of that silence because we also talked how problematic these stories are, uh, problematic in their content in relation to the female gender, right? So we were kind of discussing as to the righteousness of such stories being passed on from one generation to another, right? And we also saw how uh, Karnad, um, describes these stories as children's literature, uh, stories told for children by women in which other women were uh, an audience. So even though they were told to children in order to make them eat or go to sleep, there were other women who were the audience for these kind of tales. So there was a kind of an indirect communication uh, going on, an exchange going on between uh, one set of women and another, right? So that is the general uh, theme which we covered in the previous session. A young girl, story says this, a young girl, her name, it doesn't matter. But she was an only daughter, so her parents called her Rani. Queen, queen of the whole wide world queen of the long tresses for when her hair was tied up in a knot it was as though a black king cobra lay curled on the nape of her neck coil upon glistening coil when it hung loose the tresses flowed a torrent of black along her young limbs and got entangled in her sil silver anklets her fond father found her a suitable husband. The young man was rich and his parents were both dead. Rani continued to live with her parents until she reached womanhood. Soon, her husband came and took her with him to his village. His name was, well, any common name will do. Apana? Apana. And then Apana enters. What is the significance of this opening section of Act 1. I want us to look at a relevant comment by Karnad in relation to his other work, um, Hayavadana. He says, uh, in relation to his work, Hayavadana, 
This is why characters in Hayavadana have no real names. The heroine is called Padmini after one of the six types into which Vatsayana classified all women. Her husband is Devadatta, a formal mode of addressing a stranger. His friend is Kapila, simply the dark one. There's a kind of a structural parallel between that comment which talks about names and this excerpt in Act 1 of uh, Nagamandala. Any name will do and, and the man says Appanna, <coughs> right? And then the story goes with that name, right? And Rani means queen, the apple of her parents' eyes, right? So these two figures, as well as the Naga, which comes later in the story, are types, archetypes, essential ideas, essential concepts, right? So it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what they are named, which is slightly problematic if the story and its ideology is problematic. Because what is being hinted at here is the notion that this is a universal tale springing from the landscape, right? So if it's a universal tale, then I wonder whether we should pass it on from mother to child, from child to another, and so on and so forth. Because this is a deeply problematic, disturbing tale in the sense that it very, very viscerally captures the gender imbalance in <coughs> society. So what this play, I believe, is doing is showcasing a particular set of access of power in society without offering a grand solution Karna doesn't go that far. Karna doesn't go that far, though he does show you in great and painful detail the lived reality for women of a particular period in India. Right? Okay, I'll, I'll leave that concept for now. We'll revisit it as we discuss um, the play further. So any common name, name will do. And I want uh, to connect this idea to another point in uh, Indian theater, let's let's find that. This is Karnad again. He says Western theater has developed a contrast between the face and the mask, the real inner person and the exterior one presents or wishes to present to the world outside. But in traditional Indian theater, the mask is only the face writ large. Since a character represents not a complex psychological entity, but an ethical archetype, the mask only presents in enlarged detail its essential moral nature. This is the theory, and we have the theory put into practice in that excerpt from Nagamandala that I just read, and also in relation to Hayavadana. Karnad, in other words, says that Western theater makes a distinction between the mask and the inner psyche. There's something ulterior in the mind, <coughs> right, which is being hidden by the mask, right? This is his hypothesis, which I want to unpack. And he says that that's not the case with Indian theater. What's out there is what's in there, right? We're not hiding anything. We are just exaggerating the inner psyche in great detail in the mask, right? So each person in the theater, according to Karnad, represents a particular moral type or a characteristic or an attribute or a tendency. Rani stands for perhaps all women, all Indian women. Appana perhaps stands for all Indian male if we put this theory into practice, right? Very simply and very roughly, 
right? So uh, this distinction is something that we need to keep in mind because Kernard works with this philosophy for much of his canon and especially in Nagamandala and Hayavadana and all his mythological works, right? Okay, Act 1, what happens in Act 1? I'm going to read uh, related sections from Act 1. So Kurdava and her son Kapuna come to the house of Rani to figure out what's going on. And Kurdava realizes that she's being um, locked inside the house. Kurdava to Rani, I'm coming child right now, don't go away to Kapuna. He keeps his wife locked up like a caged bird. I must talk to her. Let me down instantly. You go home if you like. So Kurdava, as we understand very clearly, is blind, who's carried about on the shoulders of her son, who's called uh, Kapana, and they are at the window, the barred window of Rani and Apana's house. The idea of her incarceration is pretty clearly visually communicated to us in that clip, right? What else is evident in that scene? The women talk through the bars, right? Conversation is not happening freely, right? They're physically restricted one way or another. That is kind of communicated there. If you read uh, that visual image a bit more closely, you will know that. All conversations between Rani and uh, Kurdava happen through bars, right? So that's, that's a very interesting concept. Perhaps we may not be able to visualize it when we are reading this play, but when you see it enacted or, or when you see it adapted for the screen, you realize that part pretty quickly, right? So she has her own, her own story to tell, which I told you in the previous session, right? Um, you remember that subplot about Kurdava, how she was not able to get married and then one fine day a mendicant gives her a root and it works. The man who eats it becomes head over heels in love with her and marries her instantly, right? And what she does, as you can see in that scene, she offers the uh, pieces of root which she has left over with her to Rani. She promises her that this will work. So she gives her that small piece of root that she has and says, <laughs> mix it in with the food and give it to your husband and it will work. And she says, um, maybe I'll read that part. She says, um, here, take this smaller piece. That should do for a pretty jasmine like you. Take it, grind it into a nice paste and feed it to your husband and watch the results. Once he smells you, he won't go sniffing after that bitch. He will make you a wife instantly, right? The language of Kurdava is pretty visceral. Right? It's, it's vulgar and the point there is to find the solution to the fact that the husband is not doing his husbandly duties, especially in relation to the uh, marital bed. Right? And I want you to go back to the direction that Kurdava gives to Appana in terms of finding that piece of root which she has kept securely. Um, that's very interesting to look at. Listen son, run home now, go into the cattle shed, the left corner, the left corner, Kurdava says just above where you keep the plough, behind the pillar, on the shelf, Kurdava says, um, behind uh, 
behind the pillar on the shelf, Kapena repeats it, behind the pillar on the shelf, there's an old tin trunk. Take it down, it's full of odds and ends, but take out the bundle of cloth, untie it, inside there is a wooden box. A wooden box, all right. In the right hand side of the wooden box is a coconut shell wrapped in a piece of paper. Inside are two pieces of uh, a root, bring them, right. Look at the way it has been secured in layer after layer of protection, right? And if you uh, see that uh, clip from the movie, uh, I don't think I have it here with me, but if you see the movie, he keeps on unpacking, you know, covers after covers, and he gets to that piece of root. What is the significance of that? There, there are two related ideas, two related ideas. One is that Kurdava faced the same problem, more or less, to the one that Rani faces right now, in the present. Both are unable to fulfill their sexual life, right? Kurdava is unable to find a husband. Rani gets a husband, but she is not able to consummate the marriage, right? Two similar issues, right? Two similar issues. And then the problem in the present can be solved by going backwards in time to the past, to the past of Kurdava and, you know, and so on. You can perhaps even go back further in time. The idea here is that women's problems more or less fall within this particular domain, right? Which can all be solved through similar solutions. Grind a root, paste, turn it into a paste, put it in food, give it to the husband, and all, all will be well, right? So Kurdava's past and Rani's present are not drastically different. The details may be, the details may be. But similar solutions are being offered by Kurdava to Rani and she messes up. She messes up, right? The first time around, the drug doesn't work. The first time around, the drug doesn't work. I have that uh, scene here with me. If you want, uh, we can see it. We realize that the solution doesn't work the first time around, right? And what response does Kurdava have for this failure, the first attempt? What does she say? Let's look at that one. That's pretty interesting. Same act one. So uh, Kurdava is back and she quizzes Rani. She asks, did you feed him the root? Yes. And what happened? Nothing. He felt giddy, fainted, then got up and left. Right? That part is exaggerated here in the movie adaptation. Right? Uh, so it's, it's exaggeration so that the audience will kind of perceive. Um, in detail as to what is the you know point of that root so that's bad this is no ordinary infatuation then kurdava says this is no ordinary infatuation then that concubine affairs is obviously who didn't want to tell you there's a woman a bazaar woman she has your husband in her clutches squeezes him dry maybe she's cast a spell Maybe she has cast a spell. That's what is interesting to me there, right? So the spell laid by the concubine, the mistress of Appana, is more powerful than the small piece of root that Kurdava offers. So there's a kind of a, a battle between several kinds of potions and roots, right? And spells, different <laughs> kinds of magic are at work, right? And she says, okay, this, this is a... A much bigger thing than we had initially thought of and she says there's only one solution to this what Kurdava giving her the bigger piece feed him this larger piece of root feed him this larger piece of root 
No, says Rani, yes. That little piece made him sick. This one, it will do good. Believe me, this is not hearsay. I'm telling you from my own experience, go in, start grinding it, make a tasty curry, mix the paste in it, let him taste a spoonful. He will be your slave. And then, just say the word and he will carry you to my house himself. We don't see that scene at all in this uh, play Nagamandala. We don't see a scene in which Kurdava and Rani meet up like neighbors and friends and, and have simple ordinary conversation. That scene is not given here. It's not offered to us by Karnad. In terms of feminine identity, we have two big extremes in this play. One is the kind of feminine identity projected by Rani. Very young, inviting, physically. At least that's what Naga tells us and Kurtava says. Only the husband is not able to kind of appreciate it. Right? So that very inviting, sexually very attractive image is one kind of identity that we have. The other is the older woman, right? women in their old age, sickly old age. If you go back to the anecdotes offered by the flames in the prologue, we have references to such old women, very sickly women who demand attention, who demand to be taken care of. And then there's this other old woman who doesn't tell stories. They're for somehow rebelling, right? It's a very interesting character, that old woman who doesn't tell stories. I particularly like her. And then we have figures such as Kurdava, right? So these two extremes are what is offered by Karnad in Nagamandala. There are other types of feminine identities which are missing. That's something to be taken note of. I, I don't know how to respond to that. I leave that to you. Okay. Rani is told not to be frightened. Na Rani is given encouragement by Kurdava and she tries to do what has been advised. And then we have Apana coming in with a dog and Apana has heard about the interventions or, or the, in, uh, you know, uh, the, he has kind of um, come to know about the presence of um, Kurdava and her son and he brings in a dog and he hopes that that dog will keep them at bay. Apana says that blind woman and her son let them step here again and they will know I'll bathe and come to eat serve my food he tells Rani. When it comes to Apana he's somehow trying to cleanse himself perhaps um, you know with not great uh, success probably. And he says, I'll bathe and come to eat, serve my food. Goes to the bathroom and starts bathing. Rani takes down her pot of curry, removes the lid, takes out the paste of the root. Rani, to the story, shall I pour it in? It's a very interesting meta-theatrical moment there. Rani asks the story, who's telling the story, right? Um, shall I pour it in? What does that signify? It signifies the power of the story to direct, to control the lives and actions of its members, of its actors. Story is Prospero-like, Prospero-like, Faustus-like in the way he manages Mephistopheles. In some ways, it's a rough comparison that I'm drawing. Right. Shall I pour it in? Apana calmly continues his bath. It is evident he has heard nothing. Rani, oh my God, what horrible mess is this? Blood, perhaps poison. Shall I serve him this? That woman is blind, but he isn't. How could he possibly not see this boiling blood? This poison is red. And then, even if he doesn't see it, how do I know it's not dangerous? Suppose something happens to my husband. What will my fate be? That little piece made him ill. Who knows? 
No, no, forgive me, God, this is evil. I was about to commit a crime. Father, mother, how could I, your daughter, agree to such a heinous act? No, I must get rid of this before he notices anything. She brings the pot out, avoids the husband in the bathroom, steps out of the house, starts pouring out the curry, stops. Rani, no, how awful, it's leaving a red stain. He's bound to notice it right here on the doorstep. What shall I do? Where can I pour it so he won't see? Story says, Rani, put it, it, put it in, in that anthill. Look at the direction that's coming from outside of the story. It makes the story very, very live. It's happening now. It's, it's not a story that has already happened. It's happening right now. It's not myth. It's not folklore. It's not some grandmother's tale. It's, it's live action right now happening on the stage. So that kind of time where it's, all, it's, where it's also present as well as past makes it very, very real in terms of its ideology which is Karna, which Karnad is trying to um, kind of uh, lay it bare very viscerally for the audience. Karnad is saying, okay, all this that's happening here in Nagamandala is pretty problematic in terms of its gender dimension. Look at the quote uh, by Karnad there. He says, uh, inevitably, the pattern of relationships she is forced to weave from these disjointed encounters must be something of a fiction. The empty house, is uh, empty house she is locked in could be the family she is married into. Right? The family becomes, the institution of the family becomes a prison in itself. Okay, that point we can clearly relate to. The other point is what is interesting to me. He says that, the kind of relationships that Rani has, both with Appana and with Naga, is something of a fiction because all these encounters are disjointed encounters, right? There's, there's no coherent linear meaning to those encounters, right? If it's Appana of the daylight hours, it's all about food, right? If it's Naga of the night time, it's all about sex, right? Food and sex, very basic functions are being required of Rani. And he says these encounters are almost fictional. They don't, they don't make sense for the woman who is, who is at the center of this, right? So this is what he is laying bare in Naga Mandala. This is what he is laying bare in Naga Mandala. Uh, but my question is, but my question is, how far, how far Rani is rebelling against the various patriarchal structures? How far? What are her moments of rebellion, right? If the story happens in the past, happens in the past of folklore, if the story happens in the past of folklore, if the story happens in the past of Kurdava, if the story happens in Rani's life, if that life is now, how do we assess the moments of rebellion? How do we assess the moments of rebellion? And what kind of power do these patriarchal structures continue to possess? continue to persist and how can we still pass them on as oral tales for children right so these are some of the ways in which you can address there's no simple answer it's a complicated medley of narratives that we have right and and if you remember the point that i was making through Lyotard in the context of um what's the story the hunger of stones the point is not the truth value of stories. The point is the story itself. The fact that it's being circulated in society time and again. We don't have to worry too much about the truth value. We just have to worry about its influence. The amount of influence and intervention it has in everybody's lives. Interestingly, uh, in the movie, this uh, movie from the 90s, interestingly, the husband doesn't buy this, right? Uh, he's not convinced by the test, the chastity test that she undergoes by holding 
the king cobra. Uh, he doesn't believe in the power of nature to impregnate her wife, his wife, right, Rani. So what he does is um, he watches his house at night and he finds out that it is Naga who transforms himself to his shape and sleeps with his own wife. He finds that out and um, in the end there is a big fight between the two, Naga and Apana, and Apana successfully kills Naga and asserts his patriarchal rights within his domestic domain, right? So metaphorically, figuratively, this 90s movie says no to gods um, if the gods would sleep with the wife. So patriarchal power is established pretty assertively uh, in this movie. If, if you read it very closely, you will know that. So, uh, so let's put the movie aside for a bit and come back to um, the perspectives that Karnad weaves around this particular play. And you know, he says that the basic concern of Indian theater in the post-independence period has been to try to define its Indianness. Right? That's one of the basic foundational aspirations of plays written after uh, Indian independence. So what is Indianness in Nagamandala according to Karnad? Right? That's the question that I want you to find answers to. What is Indianness in Nagamandala? What are its important tenets? Folklore? Folklore? And and what else? Find out. The ideas that I'm um, sharing with you are from Karnat's introduction. So you don't have to go very far to find out um, the source of all these quotations um, that I attribute to Karnat. They are in his introduction to the Oxford edition of his three plays. Right? Uh, this is an interesting quote that he refers to in his introduction. Karnat says that the door banged by Nora in the doll's house, Ibsen's doll's house, did not merely announce feminist rebellion against social slavery. It summed up what was to be the main theme of Western realistic drama over the next hundred years. A person's need to be seen as an individual, as an entity valuable in itself, independent of family and social circumstance. That's what, according to Karnad, is embodied, communicated in Ibsen's The Doll's House. The value of an individual, the identity of an individual devoid of family and social relationships, right? So it not merely represents feminist rebellion on the part of Nora, it represents the assertion of an individual, right? And he says that, he goes on to say that this kind of exploration of the rights and values of the individual doesn't happen in the Indian theater. This is Karnat's perspective, right? He says that even though we have a massive urban population, the basic tenet of bourgeoisie ideology, which is the celebration of the individual at the expense of all other factors such as family class, is not explored at great depth in uh, Indian theatre. Right? So I want us to keep that concept in mind and read Nagamandala against these ideas that Karnad discusses in the introduction. How far does his own play hold up to all these values that he discusses, all these concepts that he probes in his introduction? It's a very interesting exercise, trust me. I'll, I'll stop here, we'll continue in the next class.